Hey, Chen Li. Hey, Ryan. How are you doing? All right, got some sleep? A uh, little bit, I was teaching earlier this morning. It's tough for you. So um, may I try uh, to see if I can share the slides? Yes, please. I made you the co-host. Okay, let me try that. Oh, looks good. You're just making sure you spelled my name right. Yep, everything's fine. It's correct, right? Yeah, good. Okay. Let's see. Do you have any movies? Anything? No movies. Okay. Same part. Same part. Just word and uh, images. Okay. Let me um uh... all right, let me stop sharing. All right, it's good. Great. And then um <laughs> we're waiting for James. Hopefully he'll come by in a second. How many classes you are teaching? Uh one class. Genetics? Genetics, yeah. Genetics for neuroscientists. Oh, hey, Jen. Your background looks familiar. Oh, you're still muted, Jen. Hey. hey. Really look forward to your talk. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was like a nervous laugh at the end of that. Okay, I will mute now. Jen, that looks like your high school class picture. What does? Oh, this picture? Your, yeah. No, it's not high school. Not that young. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the afternoon sun is shining too much. Yeah. How's oh. the tortoise doing? Where are you? Shanghai or Beijing? Shanghai. Shanghai. Nice. I'm going to um, Hefei next week. Oh, nice. Visiting Tianxue? Uh, um, some meeting, yeah. And also some meeting on like organelle dynamics or something like that. Cool. That's my hometown. Yeah. Hi, James. Thanks for coming. Hello there. Hey, do you want to give your slides a test? Sure. Yeah, let me. Should be good. Uh, ch -ch -ch. And that should be good now, right? Um. Do. Um. Do like the swap where you swap. Yeah, perfect. Yep, looks great. Oh, it's it's okay now? Yeah, it looks good. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. Great. Oh, I'm looking forward to giving the talk. Yeah, we're looking forward to hearing it. There's lots of interest in, or everywhere, in, endocannabinoid sensors and tools for studying them. Indeed, it's quite a quite an emerging field here. Oh yeah, one thing I wanted to mention, Aaron, is actually I'm not a assistant scientist in the volume. Since we, we started out, I'm now assistant professor in a different department at OHSU, the chemical physiology and biochemistry department. I have a joint oh, okay. appointment. I have a joint appointment in the volume as well, but just wanted to point that oh, out. Okay for your right. intro. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think um, DeLong is going to do your intro today. Perfect.
is your lab um, in the volum or you're, you're just uh, we, we uh, used to leave? We used, oh, used to be to. in the volum. We just moved to a new new building at OHSU. It's right next door to the volum still. Have you ever been there? Um, yeah, I used to. I used to actually come up there. It seemed like every year to do like a talk or like teach in a class, and um, I just love coming to Portland. Hmm. So I try to like finagle invitations as much as I could. I would yeah. hang out with like Gary Westbrook. Um, yeah, so it was good. Yeah, I used to be sharing. Mark Freeman gave me the two bays at the end of his lab when I was a research assistant professor and starting out and getting everything all all set up. And now the the whole the real position kicked in, and I got my own uh, own space now in a new building. So nice, cool. Yeah. So you sort of had like a little bit of a running start. Yes. Technically, my uh, assistant professorship just started in July, so uh, oh, great. Cool. we already got a paper out and uh, four people in the lab at the moment, three graduate wow. students, so. Uh, wow. Yeah, that really messed me up when I got my first grad student. Then I was thinking, like, wow, like the, this person is putting their career in my hands, so, um, <laughs> so I was really nervous about that. Yep, I can relate to that for sure. They're all doing fine, I think, at least from my perspective. Maybe they'll disagree with me. <laughs> hey, it's a long. Hi, Ross. Hi, Tim. Hey. Hello. Hey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah, we should invite another few fellows as Wallen. See. Next next week we have one more. Oh yeah, um, uh, I took good friend and brought him, um, Chinese couple. Chen Yi. Yeah, yeah, Tian Yi. No, and she, Hining. She, she, yeah, Tian yeah, Yi. Yeah. Tian Yi gave one of the first talks for NeuroZoom. Yeah, already I believe. So Tian Yi, wait, what is it? Tian Yi's classmate? Or Tianyi went to high school with the, I don't know, there's some connection. Tianyi went to the, went to high school with the husband of the Huawei CFO. There's some, some okay. connection with like, yeah. Some, well, no, some yeah, you're not same, same, same age. <laughs> um, not Maybe the founder. The same school, like, but, okay. No, I think, I think same class. I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, Shenru is here. Chen Li, you have your fan club here. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, actually, try to do it on, on time. Yeah, you can sure. have yeah. some few yeah. questions. <laughs> All right, do a short time. OK, OK. Yeah. Great. But I have 80 slides though. <laughs> and try to uh, 20 seconds of per slide. Right. Or just do every other slide. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Random sampling. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, when 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 you started in UT Southwestern, summer, I remember you, and in in, in Gage's lab, and I had a friend uh, uh, Yan Li, also the same time overlap with you, right? I saw. Me, right? Yeah, Yan Li. Yeah, I started in uh, uh, '97 at UT Southwestern, then in 2003 mm -hmm. moved to Song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, 97. I was still in college. I was just starting college. <laughs> sure. Uh, Where were you starting yeah. college, Aaron? 
the best best university in the world. Penn State yeah. University. Yeah. Hey, Melissa, how's Penn State? It's good. It's it's uh it's nice to have the students all back. You know, it's mm -hmm. pretty normal. It's going oh. been going pretty smoothly. Great, nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious when you, you guys gonna start a yearly 4 p.m. seminar series. Uh, Stanford, East West Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it started. It started already. Yeah, the in-person yeah. talk seminar. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Maybe Jun can tell us more. But I, I've, I've been seeing those announcements. I think there's also some virtual component to it. <clears throat> right. Yeah, yeah I saw this. Yeah. It's mixed. It's a uh, mixed in person and uh, virtual, and uh, it's on Thursday noon every week. Okay, okay. Yeah. So that's that's something I worry about because the usually is like four p.m. seminar. We, we sometimes conflict with New Zoom because New Zoom is start at five p.m. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, they they know to not schedule it to overlap. Oh yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. All right, so long. Maybe should I get started? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, go ahead. All right, we have a lot of ground to cover today. Mm -hmm. So, welcome everyone to an exciting new week of NeuroZoom. And uh, before we get started with the excitement, just an uh, announcement that next week we continue our Volum OHSU series, and we have uh, RP Saunders. And we also have from Scripps, uh, Holly Klein. So, those will be great talks. Uh, please tune in. And now uh, it's along. You can introduce okay. the first speaker. Great, great. As uh, we're happy to introduce uh, uh, Professor James Frank from Wallen Institute. So James had got his uh, uh, bachelor degree in chemistry. It says you really track where you have the amazing discovery uh, in, in neuroscience. So you really started bachelor degree in chemistry, uh, and in UBC in Vancouver. After that, after that, uh, he went to his uh, PhD has um, with the uh, in organic, organic chemistry again in Munich, and after all the chemistry training, is starting starting working working about like electronics group in MIT with uh, Professor Paulina and Kiva, where he started to engineer the photochemical probe to uh, starting to see whether it can control you know circuitry activity and, and further the behavior of removing uh, uh, mice. So in 2018. He joined the Volume Institute. Um, uh, later, later on, had appointment in OHSU, and in his lab, he's interested in using the uh, studying the uh, role of uh, lipids in cell cell physiology. But today, uh, James is going to share with uh, us his recent discovery about a chemical tool to uh, manipulating or emulating uh, endocannabinoids uh, in the reward system. So, welcome, James. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Zilong, uh, for that kind uh, introduction here. Just let me get my slides running. Yeah, you might want to switch this display. Okay, great. Oops. Sorry, I crashed. Let me try. <laughs> Of course. Oops. Yeah, you know It worked a second ago. And how about this? Have you switched, swapped? Yeah, we want to see the presenter view. So yeah, I don't know what's weird. going on here. Just a second here. I'm having double monitor problems. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Hi. 
How about that? No, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's still presenter view. Really? Wait, yeah. no, it looks good. Is it good now? Yeah, we can, we can start with good that. Now. Oh, yeah, yeah, great, great, great. Yeah, great. it's okay. good now. It's just taking a minute. Okay. Um, All right. Okay, so I'm looking forward to, to give you guys a kind of a brief overview of what my lab has been working on for the last while. Maybe it's a little bit different from uh, something that uh, has been talked about at the, the NeuroZoom before. So, you know, I'll just give you the preface that I am a chemist, so there will be some chemical structures in here, but uh, yeah, you know, don't hesitate to, to stop me at any point. Um, you know, I'm happy to take some questions along the way. So just as an overlap view of what my lab has been working on for the, the past few years is we are synthesizing molecular tools which allow us to control and visualize uh, lipid and especially cannabinoid signaling. Um, so we are a chemistry lab at heart. We synthesize these small molecule probes, and then we go and test them in some heterologous culture system like hex cells. And once we validated our, our probes in these cultures, we move them to primary cells and then into tissue and then into, into vivo, in vivo. And I'm going to give you an example of, of how one of these stories um, today. Uh, we work in two main arenas. One of them is the endocrine pancreas and especially these excitable pancreatic beta cells which secrete insulin. And we try and study how cannabinoids uh, affect the secretion of, of insulin and beta cell membrane potential. We also work in the brain and particularly in the reward system and the mesolimbic dopamine system. And we're trying to use our, our light controllable cannabinoid molecules to study how cannabinoids modulate reward signaling and of sugar, um, and especially in the VTA. So since this is a NeuroZoom, I think I'll, I'll focus a little more on the, on the latter project here. So when I say, say cannabinoid system, what exactly am I talking about? So in the, in the 70s, this molecule on the top left was discovered here. So this is tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this molecule, especially if you live in the Pacific Northwest or have ever been here. And this is the psychoactive component of, of THC or marijuana. Now, THC um, actually... Uh, has its psychoactive effects by activating inhibitory CB1 receptors, which are GIO coupled uh, GPCRs in the, in the brain. Um, and it was later discovered that there was a cannabinoid receptor 2, which is also another inhibitory GPCR that's more uh, highly expressed in the periphery. And so we have this exogenous cannabinoid ligand and these two receptors, which are expressed in the brain of the periphery. And it wasn't until about 10 years later that they discovered these endogenous cannabinoid molecules or endocannabinoids. And these are actually lipid molecules. An example of the chemical structures is shown right here. This is anandamide. It's a very famous uh, molecule. It's called the bliss molecule. Um, and the, it has two kind of main components. One is this polar head group, which is attached by an amide bond to this long lipid chain. And this polar head group and lipid chain can vary quite dramatically. There are more than 50 of these molecules that have been identified in humans. Um, and because there are so many of these molecules, we're starting to find more and more receptors. Uh, you know, it seems like every day there's a new type of quote unquote cannabinoid receptor uh, being discovered. So the cannabinoid system has expanded. And what I like to think about the cannabinoid system now includes a number of orphan GPCRs. So these are stimulatory GPCRs or G-alpha-Q coupled like GPR 18, 55, and 119. We actually published just a, a new paper on optically controlling GPR 55, which I won't have time to talk about today. Um, there are a number of other ion channels, for example, TRIP-V channels uh, and voltage activated calcium channels also are activated um, by these lipid endocannabinoid molecules. And so um, from a pharmacology perspective, this diversity presents quite a big problem because if you were to take your cell or tissue of interest and you were to say, just apply anandamide to it, um, what you would find is that you would kind of have this convoluted effect where multiple receptors that respond to the cannabinoids are actually um, being activated. So, you know, you might have trip channels, CB1 and CB2, and that makes it very difficult uh, to, 
deconvolute what receptors are actually involved in a signaling response. So we make chemical tools which allow us to more precisely probe these pathways. Um, so hold on here. Why am I frozen? Uh oh. Oh, there we go. Can you? Am I good now? Oh, that's good. Okay, so uh, my work kind of lives in the realm of what we call photopharmacology, which is rewiring biology to respond to light. So many of you are familiar with optogenetics, where you use a light response to protein to translate an optical stimulus into a biological response. But as a chemist, we design a light response of molecules, which allow us to target recept specific receptors in a light-dependent fashion. Um, why you want to use light for a number of reasons, mainly because it can be applied with like essentially unmatched spatial temporal resolution. You have basically diffraction uh, limited spatial resolution and picosecond temporal resolution. So if you can shine a precisely tuned uh, uh, laser beam on a specific component of a cell or a specific cell in a brain slice, for example, um, and be able to activate a specific receptor, um, this is something you can't do by just like bath applying a drug to your, to your tissue, for example. Another really desirable property of light is that there's a whole variety of flavors to the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so if you can design tools that are responsive to different colors of light, you can actually use uh, uh, use a variety of tools and different colors to create very specific and uh, sophisticated signaling patterns. So um, one of the ways which we, we do this is through this molecule shown here, which is called the azobenzene. Uh, it's a relatively simple and small molecule. It exists in two different states. In the dark, it's in the trans configuration, uh, which is very flat and nonpolar. It kind of looks like a surfboard, actually. And when you irradiate this azobenzene with UV light, it isomerizes to the cis form, uh, which is kind of V-shaped. It has a large dipole moment. It's very polar. Um, and it's a very structurally distinct from the trans form of the azobenzene. And when you irradiate this molecule with blue light, it isomerizes back to trans. And you can do this process over hundreds of thousands of cycles without any desensitization or photo bleaching. It's a very efficient photo switch. Now, how this uh, comes into signaling is when you start attaching ligands to this azobenzene uh, photo switch here. And now you can imagine a situation uh, where we have attached a ligand for an ion channel to this azobenzene photo switch. If we apply it to neurons in one configuration of the azobenzene, the molecule does not affect uh, the ion channel, but when you isomerize the azobenzene to cis, it becomes much more potent. It'll open an ion channel and depolarize the, the neuron, for example. And there are many of examples um, which, which show this, and I'm gonna get into this in a little bit more detail in a minute. So um, to, to start this talk off, I'd like to tell you a story that we've really taken from the uh, round bottom flask all the way to controlling behavior in rodents. Um, and that's involving the optical control of TRIP-V1 or the vanilloid receptor one. This is a non-selective cation channel that's expressed in the trigeminal and dorsal root ganglia. It's involved in nociception, the inflammatory response and arguably body temperature regulation. It's TRIP-V1 is quite unique in that it's uh, heat sensitive. So temperature is above 43 degrees Celsius. A number of spider toxins or jellyfish toxins will activate it. And important to this talk is the number of endocrine cannabinoid lipids also will activate TRIP-V1. So here are a few examples of the molecules that activate this receptor here. You're all familiar with capsaicin, which is a component of chili peppers, which gives you a burning sensation when you eat something hot. And then these endocannabinoid molecules, arachidonyl dopamine and anandamide also activate TRIP-V1. And from a chemist perspective, if you look at these molecules, you'll see that they all have a very similar structural motif. They again have this polar head group attached by an amide bond to some type of a, a long fatty chain. And it actually turns out that the composition of this fatty chain doesn't really matter that much, but it'll actually tune the potency and pungency of these different molecules activating the receptor. So um, way back at the beginning of my PhD in Dirk Trauner's lab, 
uh, in Munich, uh, I designed this molecule, which is essentially a photo switchable derivative of this molecule, capsaicin. So we called this ASCA4 for azocapsaicin. It has your capsaicin head group attached here. And then we attached it to this uh, photo switchable lipid chain, which contains an azobenzene photo switch. And it turns out that this molecule is less potent in the transform. And when you irradiate this with UV light, it isomerizes to cis. Um, that increases the efficacy or potency of the drug towards trip one And if you apply this molecule you know, to dorsal root ganglion neurons of a mouse that express trip one by just shining different colors of light on these neurons, you can turn action potential firing on and off um, through activating the sign channel. And so that, you know, that works really fantastic in a dish, but this always kind of gave me a bit of a you know, problem here. And uh, how do we actually go transition from you know, working with these molecules in a dish to doing experiments in freely moving animals? And it turns out there's kind of two main uh, problems associated with this. One is the phototoxicity and poor tissue penetration of UV light. And then the second is just this general lack of integrated hardware that allows for compound delivery and optical stimulation, especially if you want to target um, regions deep within a, in a mouse brain. I wanted to solve these problems. Um, the first problem, uh, so the UV light requirement was solved by chemistry. Um, to make a long story short, a colleague of mine named David Conrad, who's now a, a junior professor at the LMU in Munich, synthesized a reg shifted derivative of this photo switchable capsaicin. You don't need to pay attention to the structure too much. You just might want to note these four chlorine atoms, which are around the center of the azobenzene. And that allows you to actually generate the cis form of this photo switch by irradiating with green light. So 560 nanometers as opposed to uh, UV. Um, and now when we apply this probe to, in this case, hex cells expressing trip V1, and we do patch clamp recordings, we can see we can induce a large inward current uh, in these um, hex cells through trip V1 when we shine uh, green light on the cells. And this is fully reversed by uh, shining blue or violet light on the cells. So we solved our requirement for UV light issue. The second problem was a little bit more involved. Um, as I mentioned before, we're interested in studying the reward system, in particular, the ventral tegmental area, which is a hub of dopamine neurons uh, that are involved in reward processing. Um, and so if you wanted to go and use this uh, capsaicin photo switch in the VTA, what you need is some type of a device that can be inserted deep into the brain, which has fluid delivery capabilities for delivering a virus encoding trip V1, as well as uh, the compound itself. And then to be able to photo switch to deliver green and blue light directly to the spot where the compound is being delivered. Um, so to, to achieve this, uh, I decided to do my postdoc in Polina Anakeva's lab at MIT because they specialize in a technique called thermal drawing. And thermal drawing essentially allows you to create very complex and multifunctional fibers um, by first creating what is called a preform, which is a macro scale template of the final device you actually want, um, which harbors all of the functional characteristics of the final fiber you're interested in. So in this case, we wanted two empty microfluidic channels and a, a waveguide and a cladding to allow light be, to be delivered along the fiber. Um, and what this process kind of looks like when you actually perform it. So this was the, the preform that I fabricated out of polycarbonate and cyclic olefin copolymer. You can see it's about four centimeters or so across, three centimeters tall in this case. And it was about one, one foot or 30 centimeters uh, long. So it's quite a large device, nothing that you could ever stick into the head of an animal. Um, and when you do this thermal drawing, it's a bit more sophisticated, but in reality, it's quite crude. You basically just stick this preform into an oven and in a very, very controlled way, stretch it out the other side. And you get a very controlled reduction of the cross section. And from this uh, 30 centimeter long preform, you end up with about half a kilometer or a kilometer long of optical fiber, which has a very conserved cross section to where you started. So this was the cross section of the final device shown here. Um, it's about 400 microns along, along its long edge and 250 along the short edge. And we have these two microfluidic channels inside and the, and the waveguide. 
And uh, <clears throat> through a process called connectorization, which I'm not going to get into today, you actually chop this fiber up into very tiny uh, pieces, which are going to be your individual devices. We attach it to these uh, pieces of Tigon tubing, um, which allow us to inject drugs or viruses in it through the fiber tip. Um, as well as this optical ferrule, which is connected to the uh, polycarbonate waveguide, and we insert this fiber tip into the head of the of the rodent. Um, <clears throat> so these devices were were quite functional. You could see we could pump like very large volumes of fluid. So if you have kind of um, heterogeneous, cloudy viral mixtures. We didn't want these to clog the tips of the devices, so the channels are very big. We can pump lots of fluid through there. Um, you can see in our like phantom brain injection, which is just an agar gel, when we inject this blue dye, we end up with just a mushroom cloud at the tip of the device. And when we flash the light on, we can see we get this very focal activation or release of green light from the tip of the device. Um, for those of you that are interested in doing optogenetic stimulation, for example, in combination with drug delivery, these devices would be perfect for your experiments because they can actually transmit light all the way across the UV visible spectrum. So from UV all the way up to the far red, um, they're transmissible. So they're you know, not just useful for in vivo photopharmacology either. Um, we decided then to apply this to the uh, reward system, um, the mesolimbic dopamine system, especially these uh, VTA dopamine neurons, which are activated by drugs of abuse, including sugar. Um, and uh, when these VTA dopamine neurons are activated, they release dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, and the amount of dopamine which is released is uh, highly correlated to the uh, how rewarding a stimuli actually is. And the, this mesolimbic dopamine system expresses a wide number of cannabinoid receptors um, at various locations. So, you know, our lab is really interested in using our tools to probe cannabinoid receptors at different parts of this circuit. Um, so back to the, the TRIP V1 story. So we decided to uh, implant this device into the VTA and alongside the uh, device implantation, we injected a lentivirus encoding for TRIP V1. Um, the advantage of using these uh, embedded microfluidic channels is we can actually um, load the virus into the tip of the device. And when we implant the device into the skull of the animal and you know, are doing this uh, surgery where we're cementing the device onto its skull, we can actually very slowly um, inject the virus. So you always end up with the virus really at the tip of the of the fiber every single time. And this is in contrast to a normal surgery where you'd often stick one needle in, you would do your viral injection, and then in a second part of the surgery, you would put your fiber in and try and hit the same spot. So this is quite advantageous. Um, and we could confirm that our lentivirus was uh, causing TRIP-V1 expression in the VTA about six weeks later or so. Um, and to make a long story short, we did uh, some condition place preference behavior where we took these mice with our devices. Um, we injected either capsaicin versus a vehicle um, and did the condition place preference test and see if we could cause a mouse to pre prefer either the bars or the holes chamber of this box. Um, we could show that uh, in comparison between capsaicin and a vehicle, the mice preferred the capsaicin injection chamber um, in this case, due to the activation of these rewarding VTA dopamine neurons. And when we applied our, our photo switch in conjunction with either green or blue light, the mice preferred the injection of our photo switch with green light, which was again, the more potent uh, form of the molecule. And just to, to kind of show you um, that this is really going via TRIP-V1, we also did the same thing with, with m cherry uh, mice. So this was lacking the ion channel, and we don't see any preference developing in this case. So um, that was uh, pretty exciting. Um, but since then, we've kind of gone back to the drawing board. Uh, we're interested also in looking at a number of other types of cannabinoid receptors. So in collaboration with Eric Carrera's lab at ETH in Zurich and also Ken Mackey, um, we developed a photo switchable derivative of, of THC. Again, this is the structure of THC. You see it has this pental chain hanging off the side here. 
And what we decided to do was actually substitute uh, that pentyl chain for an azobenzene photo switch to make an azo THC. Now we have a molecule again, which is more potent in the cis form. So when we irradiate this with UV light, it becomes um, more potent. CB1, when it's activated, inhibits adenylocyclase to decrease CAMP levels. It also opens GERC channels inside cells to hyperpolarize them. And we could show that our azo THC could light dependently control both of these pathways. So we have the cyst form of the molecule inhibiting adenylate cyclase more strongly. And if you look at this patch clamp recording, I think it's a little bit more clear here when we're recording these GERC currents. Um, when we photo switch or turn the molecule on, we see the GERC channels opening and this can be reversed by blue light. And if we apply a CB1 antagonist Ramona band, we completely block uh, the effect. We're also looking at developing probes for CB2. Um, this is, we took the same type of strategy here, except for we changed the ligand. So this is a CB2 agonist called HU308, which is about 10,000 times or so more selective for CB2 or CB1. It has this long chain hanging off the end. So we decided to substitute that with an azobenzene to make our azo HU308. Um, and in actually trying to test this uh, cell or this probe in different cell lines, we discovered that CB2 could actually couple to um, uh, GQ pathways. So in this case, when we have cells which are expressing CB2 and we apply our photo switch and isomerize it to the cis form, we have a large increase. This is uh, calcium imaging. We have a large calcium influx, um, which was dependent on phospholipase C. Um, and uh, that CB2 can basically stimulate this calcium induced calcium release in these cells. Um, so just this is kind of the, the last bit of my talk here. I just kind of want to leave you with a little bit of perspective of where we're going. We're really interested in now taking these tools, which we've tested essentially in a cell line and moving them in onto the next you know, frontier, both into tissue and eventually in vivo. Um, but how do we, you know, we end up with a bit of a problem when we get into tissue because how do we get you know, cell type resolution? Or what if we really want cell subcellular resolution? What if we wanna target uh, CB1 receptors on the presynaptic terminal of this pink neuron shown here, for example? Well, one of the ways which we're doing this is using these genetically encoded uh, protein tags called SNAP tags. Basically, SNAP tags are a protein that you can express on any cell type or even a specific location in a cell that you want. You could imagine this yellow star being our photo switchable THC, for example. If we conjugate it to this benzylguanine, we can now target our photo switch to specific neurons in a tissue. And by expressing SNAP tags on different organelles or uh, you know, subcellular compartments, um, we can really start to dissect where exactly the cannabinoid receptors are sitting in these circuits and how they contribute to neural circuit function. So I just kind of want to leave you with that, um, especially because my lab is uh, looking for postdoc uh, positions at the moment. Uh, so we're especially looking for someone who's interest, who has kind of a physiology background or fiber photometry background. So if you're interested, uh, check out our website or give me an email and I'm happy to tell you about some more of the upcoming projects in the lab. Um, with that, I just want to thank my uh, current lab members at OHSU, along with a number of collaborators who've been extremely helpful in, in getting both my uh, postdoc and uh, individual lab uh, running, um, and you for your attention. And I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, James, for an amazing talk. I have a quick question following uh, about the uh, about the photoconvertible CB1 and CB2. So sure. how that diffusion into the brain tissue have you measured and how that will be compete with endogenous, potentially endogenous receptor? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So what we know about azobenzenes is that they can actually control, they affect the localization of these molecules when you apply them mm -hmm. to the cells pretty dramatically. Okay. So, you okay. know, if you compare the THC scaffold, which just has right. this long chain versus mm -hmm. the azobenzene, which is very aromatic, what we know, for example, is that the azobenzene will drag molecules across a membrane in 
they tend to localize in the ER of cells. So this is one of the reasons why we really want to get into this genetic targeting approach where we can use these snap tags to really like physically tether the molecule to the plasma membrane or on a presynaptic terminal, for example. Um, and then basically we can inject at whatever concentration we want, as long as our molecules are soluble. Um, brain uh, tissue has a lot of fat in it, so we tend to think that these molecules, once we inject them into the brain, they're going to diffuse all over the place. And hopefully these uh, protein tags will help us like retain the molecules at the spot where we want to um, and control signaling in, in that way. I hope. Sure. Does that sure. help? Yeah. Yeah. No questions? Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, James. Thanks, James. Uh, people, you can still uh, raise a question in the chat bar. Uh, you already, uh, James, will answer a particular question on chat bar. Thanks. All right. All right, everyone, you want to start to introduce Trini? Great. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, before we start with Trin Lee's talk, just a brief editorial comment. Um, so it's now been uh, 18 months since we've been doing NeuroZoom, 18 months straight, a year and a half. And uh, when we set this up, uh, many of my colleagues urged me to set this meeting up as a webinar in case audience members tried to disrupt. But Zolong and I thought it was important, actually essential that everyone in the room was equal, all sitting together um, from famous neuroscientists like um, Ishi Jin or uh, deans of medical schools, presidents of universities, all the way to first year graduate students, that we're all together and equal and that we could have uh, rigorous scientific uh, discussions, sometimes intense, uh, but always um, always respectful and collegial. So um, we fight hard for the science we pursue, we put in maximum effort, but at the end of the day, we're just trying to learn more about how the brain works. And um, we all know that science is the pursuit of truth, but that path to truth isn't always a straight line. Um, moreover, science is performed by humans, we all approach things from different perspectives and this diversity um, of how we pr approach science is a strength and not a weakness. Um, so I think the great thing about our community, especially neuroscience, is that we're an international community. We all try to work together to learn about the brain, but we come at it from different perspectives and we're trying to see how it works and come up with treatments for terrible diseases to help humankind. And a lot of this depends on us trusting each other and being open. And before the end of this year, many people around the world will suffer from these diseases and they're desperate for us to work together to help uh, help them. They're collectively calling on us to stop gossiping, put aside what to them seems like petty differences. If we really think about it, they're probably right. Put aside our petty differences and work together, share data, come to the right answer together. And uh, they want us on one hand to admit when other interpretations to our data seem more plausible, to not cling to old shibboleths, adapt to new information. But on the other hand, they want us to not play the gotcha game by amplifying the one thing that might be wrong about someone else's finding. But instead, let's focus on the things that are actually right and that will lead to new understanding. This is the way um, science works. We build on other people's ideas. And sometimes those ideas can be seen in a new light when new data is presented. It takes a lot of courage to put your name on a paper, a lot of courage, and say, this is what I believe and to show the evidence especially if it goes against conventional wisdom. So many of you, I suspect, are here because you heard of a controversy and are looking to see someone be proved right or wrong. I hope what you're about to see, however, is how science ought to work. There are some intriguing observations described and hypotheses are formed to explain those observations. When new tools and methods are developed, sometimes those interpretations may change, but this shouldn't take away anything from the scientists who made the original observation, since they were, in a way, pioneers. In the months to come, I have no doubt that what we're about to hear some of you will revisit those findings and find new things to reinterpret, new ways to reinterpret them. This is not a flaw in science. This is science. So just two quick, simple requests. Let's have faith in each other's motives as scientists. We're all trying to get the right answer. Let's give our colleagues and competitors the benefit of the doubt. And two, let's separate scientific criticism from personal criticism, especially for my senior colleagues in the field. Our students are watching and let's try and build a welcoming community for everyone even if they have different perspectives than ours. Let's listen to their perspective and be open. Okay, so now um, it's really a great pleasure to introduce Chen Li Zhang. I've known Chen Li for like 20 years now since he was a graduate student um, at UT Southwestern in Eric Olson's lab. Before being a grad student, he was an undergrad at uh, Wuhan University, 
and then came to Texas where he worked uh, with Eric Olson. And at the time I was a graduate student with John Epstein and Penn working on cardiac development. And uh, Chen Li published uh, a, an incredible paper in Cell in which he studied uh, the role of uh, histone deacetylases in car regulation of cardiac gene expression. And he made a knockout of HTAC9 that had such a spectacular phenotype. The knockouts developed this dramatic cardio cardiac hypertrophy, so much so that the hearts were literally bursting out of the chest of these mice. So it was a um, striking phenotype. He then did a postdoctoral fellowship with Ron Evans and worked with Rusty Gage at the Salk Institute where he studied um, adult neural stem cells, learning and memory. And then he started his own um, faculty position at UT Southwestern. His current research interests, well, he'll tell you what his current research interests are. All right, Charlie, go for it. So you're still muted, Charlie. Okay, um, let me just a little bit. Yep, that's good. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron, for this uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I don't know what, who is joining, but uh, um, also thank uh, Aaron and Zalong for this uh, wonderful series of uh, New York Talk, uh, which connect all of all of us uh, through the world. And uh, today I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, glial reprogramming in vivo. So um, I was trained as uh, Aaron um, uh, introduced, I kind of trained on the adult neurogenesis uh, uh, when I was a postdoc uh, at the Salt Institute. So adult neurogenesis uh, indicating that uh, the neurons are being produced in the adult stage so over the many years um, that only two regions have uh, robust neurogenesis, one is this uh, dentate gyrus, uh, which the neurons produce uh, from the neural stem cells and, uh, uh, and these, cells, uh, these neurons then integrate into the local circuits of the dentate gyrus and which play a major role in learning memory. The other part of the brain has ongoing neurogenesis is the lateral ventricle. And uh, these neurons, Normally migrate to the offered bulbs and uh, integrate to the circuits of, of you know uh, offered bulbs, and it's important for affection and also maintain the stretch of the offered bulbs. And uh, over the many years, um, the uh, the cellular steps from neural stem cells to become neurons has been uh, has become clear that starting from the neural stem cells and then go through the progenitor cells and uh, immature and mature neurons. So I really want to, uh, to remember these few uh, factors like uh, ASL1 nesting and uh, double coating, which is one important factor that uh, express the immature and uh, the transition step with this uh, relative you know, mature neurons, with, uh, which is expressed in your end. And uh, so these are the key markers I want to remember. So double coating is a marker for neuroblast, uh, but also for immature neurons. And there's overlap between uh, double coding and new N. New N is a marker for mature neurons. So over the many years of my postdoc uh, training on the adult neurogenesis, you quickly realize that uh, these are the regions of neurogenesis. But uh, if you look you know, through the brain and also in the spinal cord, there's no ongoing neurogenesis in all these other regions. But uh, you know, the um, Neural damage, neural degeneration not only happens to this dental jars or the lateral ventricle or for the bulbs, but also in other regions of the brain. So the question is that can we generate new neurons in those non neurogenic regions of the adult central nervous system? So that's the question um, I asked when I set up my uh, lab in 2008 at the UD South, South Western. So today I'm gonna to have two topics. And uh, one is about in vivo reprogram of glia to neurons. And the second, I'm gonna talk about the neural D1 is the uh, neural D1 is the OMRT that for neurogenesis from the uh, glia, uh, especially in the uh, adult uh, brain. So for the first part is the kind of, um, is a contribution and uh, the, the achievement of many of uh, my you know, former and current alum members. And especially like uh, Windsor and Tong and Chida and Lele and Wendia. And they worked on the brain and also spinal cord. And also in collaboration with my uh, uh, collaborators uh, at uh, Indiana University, uh, which he and Dr. Shan Hughes lab on the spinal cord injury uh, studies. So I will go uh, briefly on the in vivo programming first. 
So why do we want to reprogram the glial cells? And like the neurons of the injury or under neural degeneration, they die quickly. And uh, once they die, they never regenerate. But uh, the glial cells is different. Glial cells such, such as astrocytes, they proliferate and uh, they you know, become more of them. And normal condition, they uh, can form the glial scar around this uh, injury area. And this glial scar is important for the initial restriction of the damage spreading, but in the long run, it may not be good because this is a form of a physical barrier. And also this uh, glial scar can secrete a lot of the cytokines and uh, other things that uh, also form a chemical barrier for axon regeneration. So these uh, existing uh, neurons, they cannot extend the axons. So we think if we can reprogram these cells into, for example, neurons, we can provide the neurons that can form neural circuits, but also can change the pathological environment that can promote uh, healthy uh, regeneration. So uh, in 2008, uh, as I said, when I started my own lab, I want to, can we really you know, reprogram those clear cells into neurons? So um, a brief uh, postdoc, uh, Wenzhen Liu, and started this project. And uh, we initially targeted this stratum because this is the biggest uh, brain part and that's, you can easily inject and will not miss it. And to target uh, the reactive glial cells and especially the reactive astrocytes, we use this GFA peer promoter. And our hypothesis is that um, normally this GFA peer promoter is and are not active in neurons, but when the red glial cells become, you know, uh, when the glial cells become activated, then the GFE promoter is activated. In that case, it can drive high expression of the candidate genes, but also this promoter can shut down once they become neurons. So that's the kind of a hypothesis. We did many, um, you know, uh, uh, candidate screening in vivo, and these candidates are divided into different pools. So in that case, we, each pool contains several factors and uh, do a quicker immune screening. So this uh, uh, kind of image to target this uh, uh, stratal region and the GIP as a control. So normally we can then after virus injection do the analysis. So um, uh, one of the key markers I mentioned is double coding. So this double coding this X is mainly expressed in the neural blast and the immature neurons. Once the neurons become mature, its expression is done like it's gone. So using this as a, a readout, uh, we can screen all these uh, pools of factors. And uh, one pool of factors, which is the uh, four factors, and to give us many of these uh, double coding powder cells. And of the series of screening, we found that SARS-2 alone is sufficient to generate tens of thousands of these cells. So for example, let me show you here, so in the control GIP injected uh, brain, so this is the endogenous lateral ventral neurogenic region. In the control we get you know, GIP, there's no double quantum positive cells in the control region. But once SARS-2 is co-expressed, now we got you know, many of these immature neurons. For example, they have this uh, small soma and have some branches. And uh, this is kind of really robust. You can see, you, you will not, never miss it. There's so many of these uh, newborn neurons. But if you look, this region relatively still closer to the lateral ventricle, one of the key questions may be, okay, so I'll still somehow induce migration of these cells from lateral ventricle into, into this region. This is not reprogramming, but there is rather induced you know, migration of endogenous stem cells and their differentiation. So uh, to test that idea, <laughs> we use a genetic approach. For example, we can specifically and genetically trace these uh, endogenous neural stem cells. And so in that case, we can use the nesting promoter driven CREA-ERTM and using the ROSA reporter, uh, create dependent reporter YP. In that case, we give uh, the mice with the tamoxifen and the specific label of this, um, you know, lateral ventricle, or even like endogenous neural stem cells, and all these cells should be labeled with the VIP. And then later on, we inject, you know, SARS-2 expression virus to see if these regions, uh, the cells in this region 
will be YP labeled or not. If it's labeled with YP, that means it's a migration from the lateral ventricle. If not, it's kind of locally induced. So this is the data. So using this you know, uh, inducible uh, lineage tracing of endogenous neural stem cells, you can see very robust labeling of this endogenous neural stem cells and their progenies. For example, this acts majority of those co-labeled with uh, YP. And if you look at this South 2 injector region in the core strata region, those cells are not being labeled. So they are not genetic trees with the YP. So really indicating that these cells are locally produced, but not from the cell migration from this you know, lateral venture called these neural stem cells. So, but if you look at this stratum, there's many cell types. And for example, of course, tons of neurons, these are endogenous neurons, and uh, the astrocytes that we think we target, but also oligodendrocytes and uh, other cells like parasites or microglia. So many, many, many cells. The question is, which one of them actually give the cells that we see? And for that, we take you know, a series of analysis. Our promoter never been expressed in microglia, and we think, okay, let's rule out that uh, non-microglia contribution. And then for other cell types, we use a series of genetic tools. For example, neurons, we can use an tomography inducible way to label endogenous neurons. And the astrocytes, we use at least two genetic lines. One's the uh, mouse human GFEP, uh, mouse GFEP promoter driven tree. The other one is the system C T2 that was generated by my colleague Bob, Bob Crew. And for the oligodendrocytes, the parasites, we can you know, tag them with a uh, NG2 crew. So, so this series of genetic analysis, we found that only astrocytes, but not any other cells generate the double coding part of cells that we see. So for example, here is the inducible way to genetic label astrocytes. So this is a tomography inducible way to label astrocytes and their lineages and using YP as a reporter. So is this report here about 90% of endogenous astrocytes can be labeled. So indicated by the GS and other C positive uh, uh, markers. And this linear trees does not trace any other cell types uh, except these a few IBA1 positive marker glia. So for example, here, this is the linear trace uh, new neurons in this core strata region. So you can see very robust labeling of double coding part cells with the YP in the cross strata region. So really suggesting that cells in these cells are from the astrocytes. And using this, we can do patch common recording of those mature neurons and to more easily visualize the cells, we use a switch to the TD tomato. In that case, we can see the cells and do patch. And some cells are really mature, they have spines and they fly repetitively, but some cells are kind of still under a mature condition. And uh, you can only fire you know, once and uh, less post number connection. So really showing that astrocytes can be reprogrammed to become mature neurons through different stops. So over the years, uh, and I can try to cut short, that we've shown that uh, astrocytes in the brain and the spinal cord can be reprogrammed to become progenitor cells, which are AR7 positive. And these cells then give rise to immature neurons and immature neurons. And this whole process actually can be kind of uh, you know, restricted in a way by P53, P21 pathway. And if you remove this P53, uh, P21 pathway, you can get a more. So basically, even one reprogrammed astrocytes, you can get a many of these mature neurons. So there's a series of publications uh, uh, in, over the past uh, many years. So um, in addition to the astrocytes, we recently shown that in vivo, the NG2 glia in the spinal cord can also be reprogrammed. It's a very interesting that after just spinal cord injury, some of these NG2 glia, but not any other cells, not astrocytes, not appendum cells, but it's just NG2 glia has a chance in the phenotypic switch. They become like uh, disease positive neurons, but these cells never become mature neurons and under this injury condition. But when, and this process also required endogenous cells too. If you remove cells too, there's no such that uh, transient 
in the table switch. And we further show that if we ectopically, ectopically uh, always process to think and draw the whole process in junior genesis. Basically, NG2P, uh, NG2P then become progenesis, and then progenesis become immature and mature neurons. And uh, furthermore, we use this uh, 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 synaptic connection analysis. <laughs> we show that, uh, we show that uh, these new neurons have connection with endogenous neurons in the spinal cord, but also uh, with those neurons in the brainstem and uh, uh, some brain regions. And uh, we also shown that uh, this whole reprogram process can reduce the scar and uh, improve the recovery of the spinal cord injury. So th this is a really nice story. And I hope in the future, I can talk really about this story instead of kind of, you know, just one slide. This is really interesting. So uh, I'm going like to move on to the next topic. And which is the uh, uh, kind of try to focus on the neural D1. And uh, uh, just for this kind of uh, today's seminar. And uh, I want to ask whether neural D1 is the almighty for astrocytes reprogramming. And this uh, work was done by the um, uh, uh, Lele Wang and Carolina. And for the fabulous work, and uh, it's very extensive analysis. So, um, it is kind of surprising to see several publications showing that uh, your D1 alone can efficiently reprogram, uh, so called efficient reprogram of the astrocytes into neurons just using AV de delivery, or on your D1 plus DLS2 in the strata region or knockdown of PDP or PPV1 uh, in different regions. And as I mentioned before, we have done a series of in vivo screening of many factors. Now, including probably a hundred of those factors just in vivo screening and uh, singularly or in combination. And these factors we have tested before, but we did not see those reported and our genetic uh, you know, uh, linear tracing. It's kind of really uh, interesting to see the data that uh, shown here, for example, neural D1 overexpression in this uh, paper claimed that neural D1 alone with the GFP as a report here for the virus, you see this massive production of the GFP positive cells. And almost, this is a kind of a stroke injury model. The colic region is almost, you know, repaired. It's kind of, it's just so astonishing that you can repair the colic region. And, uh, and most importantly, these GFP positive cells have these perfect projections and orientations and the layering in the colic region. For example, they have very long projections, and sometimes even project into the spinal cord. This is kind of amazing, it looks like colic rebuilt, long projections, and this is so unbelievably good. And this process is really rapid and efficient. For example, using this amateur as a reporter for the virus, AV virus infected region, and in the neural D1 condition, by 17 days, 17 days after virus infection, you see about 80% of these amateur pot cells are new and positive. And uh, so this uh, compared to the control is kind of you know, about 10%. So this is kind of draw our attention because we have done this analysis for so many years, but uh, you know, in our genetic uh, linear tracing, we never see such things. So for that, we did, you know, let's do some re, you know, repeat uh, experiments as the uh, paper you know, reported. So for that, using this uh, human GFE promoter driven uh, m cherry or the neural D1 and m cherry. So these are two different AV viruses. And we did a series of AV cell types. We found that AV5 is the best to target astrocytes. And all the uh, cell types is in, uh, you know, not good as the AV5 for in vivo targeting. So here is the uh, data. At the four uh, days post virus, we see you know, pretty good exercise in the M, uh, you know, cherry along of the ND1 M cherry. And uh, very interestingly, we can reproduce it perfectly with those reported. And for example, here, about 17 days, in the control condition, we mainly see astrocytes. 
But in the end, in your D1 I'm sure, you know, in the brain, we see massive I'm sure positive neurons. You see there's lots of those I'm sure positive neurons. It's a perfect uh, re reproduction of previous publications. So shown here is the quantification. And by 17 days post-virus injection, we got about 80% of those amateur pop cells in the your D1 injected uh, brain regions. This is just as like a, a previous reporting. But if you look the uh, uh, the cell density, and the interesting, we do not see you know uh, in a cell density change. Even though with this 80% production of these amateur positive cells, neurons, but uh, there's no change on the overall uh, the uh, neuron density in the injected region. As I mentioned before, the neurogenesis normally goes through the immature and the mature neurons. So even though for the glial cells, as a vision before, uh, even though this reprogrammed glial cells, they all go through this immature and the mature stage. So for that, we analyze whether this neural D1 induced uh, production of amateur positive neurons go through this and immature stage, we did the atomic cross analysis. So the lateral ventricle as a positive control for the D sex is standing and shown here. And during this atomic cross analysis, we never see any double coding positive cells in the neural D1 in general region, even though we gradually see many of these amateur positive neurons. So to really you know, understand what's going on, you know, as before we, okay, let's do uh, genetic linear tracing. So for that, um, we adopted this uh, a new version of the uh, exercise linear tracing. So this is the LDH11 CREAT2. And for label exercise, we cross that to the reporter, Rosa Lucas uh, CREAT dependent of RP reporter. And this, um, genetic nutrition have very efficiently labeled endogenous uh, exercise identified by the LDH1 or LDOC. Some neurons, about 45% of new positive neurons also been labeled by YLP in this mouse line. And the efficiency is really good. It's about over 95%. So this is specificity and this is the efficiency. So really specific and efficient label of endogenous exercise. So for that, then we inject this uh, AAV5 M cherry or neural D1 M cherry into this mouse. So this mouse already previously injected to mosfen to label endogenous exercise. Once again, we can reproduce really well that about now it's 70 to 80% of this M cherry positive cells in the only in the neural D1 injection region uh, also express new N shown here. But if you look at this YLP positive cells, and in this region, there's no of any of these YLP positive cells become neurons. So there's no YLP labeled cells become neurons, even though with this so much amateur positive neurons in the neural D1 condition. So this is a really seeing that the well reported neurons do not come from genetically traced astrocytes. So how about this neural D1 and uh, DS2 condition? So this is, uh, you know, maybe neural D1 alone does not convert, but how about you know, with the presence of DS2, you can really reprogram this drug exercise into neurons. And uh, in this paper, they actually did some linear tracing. So basically um, the GFAP Cree mouse um, inject with this uh, pre-dependent AV, AV virus, and this is your D1 M cherry plus the DS2 M cherry. And they use the M cherry, the virus express M cherry as the reporter for the you know, uh, so called exercise in this mouse line. So, so this is the Tom Land, the you know, Tom Cross analysis. And uh, sure enough, um, about six, you know, 50, 60, you about you know, around 60% of this M cherry positive cells are new and positive. So this is kind of, if, you know, for traditional like linear tracing, this is a little bit different because you still use the virus reporter as the linear tracer, but this virus reporter is exogenous, not the endogenous reporter. 
So we reproduce this uh, experiment instead of just using the virus reporter, but we are also using this, uh, you know, the question is why not using genetic lineage, uh, lineage reporter, like for example, r 26 or YFP. So we reproduce this experiment and, uh, but we include this uh, YFP reporter in this uh, same mouse GFEP prim uh, mouse line. So in that case, all the pre-expressing exercise will be labeled with, with the YP. So this approach can label majority of this uh, you know, uh, exercise really well, very, very few new, uh, new impossible neurons, about 90% of this uh, exercise, market expressing exercise being labeled. So this is a really efficient way and the crease is consecutively expressed and if any crease activity there, then you just got to this YP being labeled. So here's the data. So with this uh, cre-dependent your DO and the DST, we got some neurons, about 40%. So about 40% of these amateur positive near, uh, cells are also near and positive. But if you look at this uh, YP, none. They are not just, you know, they're not traced. So this is kind of really interesting. Why there's no kind of YP labeled you know, neurons? Even though you see this so many neurons uh, that are amateur positive. So to really understand what's going on, and uh, we did a very preliminary mechanistic studies. So for that, we did a series of uh, you know mutation uh, analysis of your D1 uh, gene and some truncations. But most importantly, we made some point mutations, just single amino acid uh, uh, switch that can kill this DM binding activity or DM binding and uh, uh, co-founded binding activity. So this is the DM binding region of the neural D1. So the mutations was made in this region. To analyze whether this mutagenesis really killed the function of uh, neural D1 for neurogenic activity, we did uh, in vitro uh, work. So this is a U2 fibrin cells and a normal condition, you got to feel this double calling part of cells. But if you, you know, overexpress neural D1, you got tons of these double calling part of cells uh, in this uh, a cultured uh, uh, neuroblastoma cells. So um, this part limitation, so this one, you got some to kind of live higher than background level, but this one is more kind of dominant negative. So really very few, or it's almost none of these double calling part of cells. So for that, we did uh, you know, AV virus injecting the same brain regions. And it's surprising that even this pollen mutation that killed the neurogenic activity of your D1, you still got you know, about 80% of these amateur positive neurons. So really interesting that these amateur positive neurons in the neural D1 condition does not replace neurogenic activity. So the question that we do not see exercise being you know, converted into neurons, you know, sometimes we see a you know, morphology change of these astrocytes. The question then, where are those amateur positive neurons? So one possibility is that they are from just endogenous neurons. So to test that idea, and uh, we use now uh, good uh, tracing. So in that case, uh, we kind of inject the retro AEV into the spinal cord. So then this AEV, they migrate into this, uh, you know, colloquial motor neurons, in this cortical region and deliver the soma. So shown here is this uh, series of brain sections. So only in this uh, cortical motor neurons region being labeled, there's no other kind of regions. If you look at the neurons, this really specific labeling of these cortical uh, spinal motor neurons. So there's no any exercise kind of labeled that identified by ARDH101 of or GFAP. GFAP is normally not expressed in the uh, colic region uh, without the injury. So, it, so only specific label of endogenous neurons. So with this really fantastic vertical labeling of endogenous neurons, we did the following experiment. So we first vertical label endogenous neurons, then you inject the AV5 virus, and then we examine what's going on. So for example here, um, in the control amateur in general region, majority are 
just, you know, uh, I'm a new M negative. But in the neural D1 internal region, we see, you know, many of these are uh, new M positive. So really kind of, no matter what do you, what do we do, we really reproduce nicely with uh, in the previous publications. But if you look, this many of these are co-labeled with the, the GFP, which is the endogenous, um, which is the marker for endogenous neurons. So this is about 40%. So this 4% overlap is really underestimated because only a fraction of this colic region being labeled by this retrograde grid tracing. So together, our study is really showing that exercise did not become these neurons, even though that's a morphological change. It is endogenous neurons that are being labeled by this virus express reporter. So our conclusion that a virus-based reporter is not reliable for lineage tracing, as we have done many, many years in the past for the in vivo reprogramming. So the question is that without this all cellular basis, how could uh, how, how do we understand the behavior improvement? So, you know, neural DNA is known for neural protection and uh, is, you know, they may protect uh, neuron death. But I would like to um, kind of draw attention to one of the reported uh, behavior, which is the fear conditioning. And uh, I'm sure majority of you uh, have done any uh, you know, behavior analysis of the hippocampus or this. Uh, is a like uh, amygdala, you will know this uh, fear condition experiment. It's kind of a simple experiment. And it's in this uh, special experiment, they did a uh, uh, lateral amygdala lesion through this ET1 inferior injection. So after that, three weeks later, they did a fear conditioning shown here. And the lesion mice, uh, lesion rat, you know, did not learn because, of course, the uh, in the amygdala is lesion. So they cannot learn compared to the water. And uh, after this learning, and they did a one test. So test one is really showing this a short-term memory. So water memorized well, so about 50%. And uh, the lesion animals do not learn well, it's about you know, 20%. So here's the interesting part. If you enjoy the AAV, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, other, the control virus on your D1 virus. And uh, so this is just AV injection. Then wait for another three weeks and retest. So this is test two. So this is kind of very really interesting phenomenon here. So this your D1 injected almost become like a water because like almost 60% memory. That's really interesting. The question is how? Because the questions I want to raise that, you know, whether the exercise has any, can learn or memorize or what? Because these mice never learn because of this fear conditioning addition. And so the addition of the metal, they cannot learn anything. The question, where the memory come from? So that's kind of question I would like to leave it to the audience who has you know, extensive, extensive knowledge on the fear conditioning and also learning memory. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude that it does in vivo conversion of glia to neurons? Definitely, yes. But is neural device the almighty to do the things? No. So, so far, there's no evidence to support that neural D1 can in vivo convert resonant exercise into neurons. However, neural D1 can push endogenous neural stem cells or neural progenitor cells toward the neurogenesis. So, this is will be consistent with this role during neural development. So with that, and I, I think I mentioned the, uh, the majority of the people that work on the project, and I also want to say special thanks to my colleague, uh, Jim Johnson and uh, Baba Ku, who provide uh, really you know, critical regions for our initial studies. So with that, I would like to take any questions if you have. Thanks so much, Trinley. Um, we have time for questions, and then also for those interested, Trinley, um, can stay longer for a more detailed discussion. Um, let's see, E, do you have a question? E san Hello, can you hey. hear me? Uh, yes. Hi, Tony. Uh, very nice work. I, um, I, I, I actually do have a question. So for your figure one, so when you use these uh, GFAP um, 
a B virus. Um, at was it at the, uh, at four days when you look at the the infected cells, looks like the neuro D group and then the control group doesn't have much changes, right? Those are astrocytes got labeled. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Correct. Seventeen days. Those astrocytes in the neuro D group, like then you see like a big morphological changes. So, so I'm just wondering if you're wondering if you that that those um those cells that were initially labeled were astrocytes, but by 17 days they changed the morphology. So, like, what's really going on there? If initially those are neurons got uh, infected, then you shouldn't see all the astrocytic morphology, right? It seems so, to me that neuro D1 is at least changing the morphology or, or is it the population is actually switching? Yeah, great question. So uh, our thinking is that definitely neuro D1 is a powerful transmission factor and can drive some gene expression. And um, we see some morphological changes if we are uh, you know, ex exclusively express neuro D1 using this pretty dependent way in the exercise. But rather as a kind of, you know, great appearance, big number of these amateur policies, we think that's gradually leak the expression of this uh, neural D1 in the neurons. So this is a kind of neural D1 dependent. In the paper, we also analyze many other factors and also many factors does not have this phenomenon, but um, some other factors do. So this is a kind of, Transpension, downstream factor dependent weakness of this AV system. So this AV reporter is really uh, being uh, controlled by the cell type and also the downstream genes. Oh, okay. okay. So, so uh, can you can you, I can, I have a quick follow up? Is um, if you e, can, can we oh. e, can we can we do just because we have tons of questions? Can we do the follow up um, maybe maybe yeah. afterward? Just just so we can get through other ones. Thanks. Sure. Um, next one is uh, Yong Jie. Hi, Erin. Uh, hi, Chun Li. Um, it's great uh, to see the other details, uh, um, the, the some of the figures. So I'm just have a, a pretty general question, actually. Um, so I think I mean it's probably not surprising the you know other you know adult brain the astrocytes probably cannot be reprogrammed much. But I noticed that uh, um, you in your in your um, um, the experiment most in most of the models are just regular adult mice and not in the injury reactive astrocytes. So I wonder, um, is that um, one of the important factor that um, only the reactive astrocytes actually takes the neural D1 more and then convert their property into neuron? Or uh, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, great question. So. Um... So because of short time, I did not include all the injury models. In the paper, we did include uh, uh, control the colic, uh, impact injury uh, and the several conditions. If you have interest, you can read those publications uh, in, the, in, the, in the figures. So we, you know, in, a, in a figure, we did use it in an injury condition and uh, in a, a few times, actually. Okay, uh, you, Jia, you have uh, a question? Do you want to ask? Yeah, here. Uh, so can you hear? Ah, uh, yes. So yeah, I'm thinking uh, there are many people waiting, so I will just make it uh, brief and quick. So I just have uh, two general questions. As you mentioned, uh, that there are another group of uh, transcription factors, uh, which for most people, uh, they are more convincing. So how about to have one of them, maybe PAC6 or ASC1 or even the uh, SOX2 you, you mentioned earlier uh, as uh, the positive control in your paper? Uh, it's the first question. Uh, the second one, uh, I'm just thinking, so for your model, uh, I don't know astrocyte too much, I know neurons more. So there are mature neurons and uh, immature neurons, and we always need to use different markers to label different stage of the neurons. So how about the astrocytes? So for the development of the astrocytes, is there any marker for mature or immature neurons? And uh, if the promoter is good enough to maybe label both uh, the mature and the immature neurons, oh, that's it. Yeah, great question. So um, in terms of the, uh, it's kind of like, uh, in terms of the uh, different immature, mature exercise, I think there's, uh, you know, there's an immature, immature stage, and definitely. So, but we focus on the mature stage, our mice at least two months old. So we do two months old and forward. 
to this uh, analysis. The GFAP promoter, you know, is, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, is highly active in the uh, reactive exercise. If it's not reactive, it's kind of you know, a weaker expression. So I forgot what's the other question. Oh, so uh, why not have uh, PAS6 or ASCO1 oh, yeah. or SOX2 yeah, as possible control? Yeah, so as I uh, in, uh, introduced in my first part is about SOX2 reprogramming. So this also did this uh, adult stage and we did a series of lineage tracing. It was a different, so many different lines, uh, tracing neurons, different glial cells. And then we also use you know, this immature neurons markers and also BRD you know, uh, incorporation assays. So really showing that SARS-2 can indeed reprogram adult exercise into neurons. And in terms of others, we have not, you know, we are kind of undergoing analysis, but at least in the AAV condition, uh, if you just overexpress uh, in a pac uh, uh, in the AAV condition, you see very robust labeling of these neurons with this virus repolier. It's about 80 to 90%, about 80%. But we also tried that many others does not work. For example, out of four, count four, and um, so others. The really kind of gene specific. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, Haiyang, you can ask your question. Hi, um, very interesting. Uh, I actually, I think that because the uh, transcription defective uh, neural demand still labels these uh, morphologically different um, amateur neuron type, that different from the M cherry alone that labels astrocyte. Is that possible? There is a promoter, purity of promoter sequence buried in the cDNA of neural D1 that yeah. actually drive the M cherry. And if you do that, basically you can isolate that, that region and do a Western blot and see whether the M cherry, the, the, the fullness protein change, or you can actually put the M cherry in, the, in, in front of neural D1 and do the, repeat the same experiment. So great question. So, um... We think the uh, you know I'm cherry uh, you know the neural D1 without neurogenic activity we think those all the amateur positive cells are endogenous neurons. I mean, I'm cherry positive neurons are endogenous neurons, and yeah. not require this uh, neurogenic activity. Now we think within the series of analysis like uh, co-injection of two different viruses, one reporter, and uh, we also did co-packaging. So we mentioned that the downstream gene is important, at least for short term. And, uh, but we have not figured out exact what region of this neural D1 gene is important. So that's kind of a still ongoing. And uh, we are not sure whether protein itself is required or not. But if so, you remove the transcription activity, it still can induce other genes, is that right? Uh, we're not sure. So basically the polymerization kill the DNA binding activity. Okay. Okay, um, Richard, uh, you can ask your question. Yes. Um, hey, Chun Li, uh, very nice talk. Richard. Hi, Richard. Hey, hey I, I have um, two small questions. So, you know, GFAP, GAP, right, only drive uh, a, sub, a subset of um, you know, in the brain. So I was wondering whether your AAV can really target, um, you know, to maybe target to other sub GFAP network of sites and then convert them to the new ones, right? So, I mean, because the exercise is highly heterogeneous, right? Yeah. My yeah. another question is, um, if I can show, if somebody can show new D overexpressed in exercise can form a uh, new N uh, positive cell, would you believe this data would be uh, for the new D1 convert exercise into new ones? So, uh, what, what, uh, uh... I assume you all talk about in vivo, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, so in terms of the uh, GFE promoter, so I think so you're right, because the heterogeneity, we're not sure whether whether they can target off the exercise if using this uh, GFE promoter in a virus condition. But we use the genetic tools to label the exercise uh, you know, either using a, a mouse GFAP Cray, which was uh, transgenic generated by the um, uh, uh, and um, but also use the RDH101. So we use a kind of two genetic 
uh, no, tools to label endogenous neuron to see whether endogenous astrocytes to see if whether endogenous astrocytes can be converted. So you know, in that case, we you know we found that even though we have tons of these amateur positive neurons, but they are not genetic traits in either of those genetic uh, transgenic lines. And uh, what's the other question? Yeah, if if someone uh, always press uh, new D one in, for example, in F sites, let's say ALDHL one positive F sites, so and then those F sites become a new M positive. Would you consider that as a um, you know, um, f to neuron conversion? I'm not, uh, I, just based on that, I'm not so convinced. So because you know, D1 is a really powerful transference factor. It may induce lots of gene expression, but does not mean kind of uh, induces a fit switch. So fit switch you need to have this, at least in terms of neurons, you have more kind of other kind of, uh, you know, morph morphological changes than neurons. And astrocytes morphology is very different. And of course, you can do other you know, marker analysis or even electrophysiology. But if it's just based on the, you know, so far our analysis, at least in the past 13 years, our analysis that our, our, our observation that a viral reporter is really bad, really bad you know, reporter as an image tracer. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um... So PW iPad eighth gen, um, maybe just t tell your name. And yes, then, uh... yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, Chen this is Ping Wu. <laughs> nice talk. Uh, I have uh, two small questions. Uh, one is, uh, 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 well, you talk about SOX2 and your D and uh, what, new, what kind of neurons are you uh, uh, converting into and uh, how, in your opinion, how to control the conversion uh, phenotype? This is the first question. Yeah, so uh, in terms of SARS-2, uh, in the strato region, majority is carotene positive cells. They are not, uh, you know, uh, this uh, top 32 positive, you know, typical strato neurons, but there's more kind of carotene positive. We did a series of analysis uh, in terms of the morphology, mark analysis, and also electrophysiology. So they are different from the other cells. And if you move to spinal cord, they generate some, you know, uh, both inhibitor and, uh, and the substitute neurons. Okay. Uh, the, 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 any, uh, by, the, by the way, in your DM, we never see any reprogrammed neurons. Okay. Another question uh, is, uh, because uh, astrocytes and neuron in, in brain and uh, spinal cord uh, usually at a ratio of one to one. Uh, and then because of astrocytes have a lot of uh, uh, functional uh, uh, benefits for the, the environment. How, in your opinion, how to control, uh, after, I mean, when you convert, uh, induce, how can you can control the ratio of conversion that will more uh, promote a functional and an efficient uh, conversion that, that can be later on translated, I mean, have a clinical uh, relevance? Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, the, the glial cells, including the NGT glia and the astrocytes, they have the ability to proliferate. So, um, whether how many of these you know, astrocytes of an NGT could have been depleted, and how many of this being reproduced through this uh, reactivation and the proliferation, the kind of left to nature do it. Basically, you know, we cannot control, you know, the ratio, but the nature probably decides, you know, how much being reproduced, you know, reproduce, uh, you know, uh, through proliferation of endogenous astrocytes or NGT glia, but neurons being produced for the repair. So, that's the way we think in just through na nature. So uh, whatever nature is required, they do it themselves. Okay, so just to let everyone let everyone know we will uh, get to all the questions. Um, I just ordered some YMI, so I have some snacks ready. So we'll stay as late as late as possible as we need. And Chen Li agreed to, yes. we, we just work through this the whole time. So uh, next is Roy. Uh, Roy, do you want to ask your question? Also, Jufei had, had the same question. 
Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, hi, Juni. Uh, so thanks so much. Um, so it looks like at 17 days post-injection, you left only with uh, neurons, like red neurons. But what happened to all the astrocytes that were labeled at the beginning, like at four days time point? Yeah, great question. So uh, it's not all neurons. It's about still 10% of these are astrocytes. And we think that the number of m positive neurons increase, you know, very, you know, quickly, but the other size is not uh, that labeled by the m -chari. So that's one way. The other way we think maybe the downregulation of m in those exercises. kind of, that's kind of, we're not quite sure, um, but, but that's our thinking. Just quick induction of m in the neural D1 condition in neurons. In that case, you see so many neurons, but the exercise you know, in the background. Okay. Um, Rachel, you can ask your question. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I'm and uh, definitely interesting to hear uh, your take on all these data. Um, I am just kind of wondering what you think about the morphological changes of the neurons. If, if you are proposing that these neurons are from endogenous neurons, um, a lot of the papers that use this approach, like three days post-injection, um, you see a pretty like interesting um, morphology of the neurons. They're like have their branches almost look um, sort of like fibrillated. Um, so are you proposing or hypothesizing that neurons actually kind of start over and lose all their synaptic connections and um, retract their processes and kind of press a restart button? Or um, do you think new neurons are being generated from already post-mitotic mature neurons? I'm, I'm just um, curious to see how you're interpreting the morphological differences um, after a short period after injection? Yeah, great question. So our hypothesis of thinking is that they gradually upregulation of the reporter. So reporter, you know, initially expressed really well in the soma and need time to spread into other regions of the cell, like dendrites, axons. So, that may explain, like initially, see a really strong soma, you know, uh, mark, you know, first uh, soma, but gradually you see more kind of the you know, and the process is being expressed. So you know, you, you know, for all this previous publication, actually, the the you know, they have perfect orientation, perfect uh, projections, really long axons. I do not think the overexpression of the transparent fractures is going to retract these processes or induce new neurons from old neurons. I think just kind of like uh, in a mirage, you think you know the marker does not really you know uh, demonstrate that they are really process growing, but rather the marker expression is increased with the time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, Jirfei, do you want to ask your question about YFP being turned down? Yes, um, uh, because uh, Mr. Trini said um, uh, the, the labeled astrocytes, um, what happened to the disp disappeared uh, labeled astrocytes? Uh, he said maybe uh, the YFP signals was turned off, uh, turned down in the astral size. But uh, my question is, how can we know if um, if the if it's possible or not that the this astral size was converted uh, were converted into neurons and the, the labels were was turned turned uh, down after the conversion? How can we exclude uh, this possibility? Yeah, so I think I, I may give you a wrong impression that we never say that the report of YP or TD tomato being turned down. So as well known and also shown in our uh, two paper that we see very robust labeling of the YP 
uh, you know, using a YP reporter for these newly produced neurons in the adult brain and also you know, immature neurons. We do not think the report is being turned down. And if and so, I, I'm not sure whether um, I, you know um, this YP pause negative reporter uh, exercise being converted. So the exercise reporter, at least in our analysis, we can identify you know over. It depends on the, in the strain. The LDH101, we can identify 95% of this exercise being uh, you know, uh, labeled with, with YP. And then in the GFAP cream motor driven YP, we can identify 90%. So basically, at least 90% to 95% of this exercise, we never see conversion by neural D1. Okay. Um, Hong, Yang, Hong Yang Jing has a question about glia to neuron conversion. Maybe you can ask that, Hong Yang. Okay, yes, uh, Dr. Zhang. Um, um, my question is the neuron, is, uh, the glia to the neuron. The neuron is uh, uh, interneuron or primary neuron. And uh, if it uh, both have, uh, how much the ratio? So, uh, so I'm not sure which, uh, uh, could you explain, uh, you know, which part uh, you uh, of the my talk you're asking is about us two about uh, neuron D one? Neuron D, uh, it's your first the the partial the uh, uh, the partial project. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So uh, thanks for clarification. So in terms of the uh, SARS two. In the strata region, we see majority are uh, double-logic neurons, but they are majority are chiralin positive. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Bruce, are you, are you able to ask your question? Okay, um, let's come back to Bruce. Uh, Jenny Jin, are, are you around to uh, ask your question? about um, m charity expression? Okay, I'll just say, so Jenny Jin asked, can you explain why you can detect m charity ex expressed from astrocyte-specific GFAP promoter in leaky neurons? In other words, how does H human HGFAP retain the activity in neurons? Yeah, that's kind of, uh, we did a simple analysis and we cannot figure out exactly our hypothesis and the data showing that the downstream factors such as neuro D1 or PAC6, but not many other factors we also tried. Neuro D1 or PAC6, the, I'm not sure it's a gene, and the DNA or the protein influence the GFAP promoter activity. In that case, the GFAP promoter activity in the virus is activated in the neurons. So in, in that case, you can drive robust expression of the immature in neurons. Okay. Gene, um, are you able to ask your question about SOX2? Go ahead. Um, yeah, just we, yeah, by the way, so this uh, kind of a transference factor dependent, uh, you know, promoting modulation of the virus was also observed by a self pressure slide. So basically, she ha still have the same observation that viral reporter can be influenced by the expressive gene. Okay, Gene, can you ask your question? Okay, so Gene wonders um, if you've used SOX2 in, to test your astrocyte YFP labeling mouse to detect actually as like a positive control. So that's the first part of my talk. And we'll come back to, oh, so Yi Sun, uh, follow-up question. Um, what, what are the initial neuron to astrocyte ratios for the control and neuro D viral injections? And what are the ratios by day 17? So, uh, let's see. Um, so the four days, um, the, ratio, the ratio is no change, basically. So four days and sometimes doesn't no ratio change. And this was also observed by our Gongcheng group. So in the uh, strata region, 
um, his extensive analysis has shown that there's no density change of the neurons. So the question that the big if, if there's any exercise converted neurons, then what happened to this old neurons? That means if there's one converted, then must be only one die. That would be terrible for the patients though. Mm -hmm. E, do you wanna have some follow-up follow questions about leaky expression? You're asking me, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. You can. Oh, yeah. So, Tony, so if you, so you talked a lot about uh, the GFAP promoter could be potentially leaky, and I think you do have, uh, and I agree with that. But if that's the case in your control virally infected cells, you should also see a lot of labeled neurons, right? But yeah, why that's, don't you see those? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great, great question. Man, the control GFP, control I'm cherry. You, you got some leakiness, but only you know, 10% 10, 10 or 20% maximum. But if you express in your D1 or PAC6 or the other factors, then you become 80%. So our analysis showing that really that the downstream genes influence the, report, the, 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 the promoter activity. So that's kind of really, that's the reason that it's kind of make so deceiving, I mean, so deceiving that, okay, you can prepare control, pretty good exercise, but if you express one factor, you got 80% 90% neurons. Then you assume, okay, that's neurons are reprogrammed because the control is not. There's only a few neurons, but that's the kind of really deceiving part. So the GFE per promoter activity in the virus condition, is influenced by downstream genes. As I said before, that this observation was also seen by uh, Seth Brasher's lab, and they have the same thing in the uh, So they see the same thing if you express different genes, the report activity or the promoter activity is influenced by the downstream genes. Okay, um, let's go Carlos, then Bruce. Carlos first. Hi. Uh... Great talk, um, Professor. So I was wondering if you have ever tried um, by any strategy, either SOX2 or NeuroD1, uh, to convert neurons in the adult brain uh, in the age mice, like uh, age uh, meaning like uh, one-year-old mice or, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, for the NeuroD1, we did not try really age the mice. We try like two to you know, three months, uh, two months to like a half a year old. But for the SARS-2, uh, we try like uh, 18 months old mice. And uh, can also induce new neurons from the exercise, but the efficiency is uh, uh, reduced compared to uh, you know, middle-aged. So um, do you think this is related to the uh, AIDS astrocyte population or because, yes, maybe there is like a different cell pool that is target at the AIDS? So for us, yeah, for us too, we try different, you know, try many different ages. And, um, but in that case, we are not sure it's, it's the environment uh, because the age, the environment is different versus the age of the uh, isocytes. So we, we are not quite sure, you know, exactly is the cell intrinsic or ex extrinsic uh, inference of the reprogramming efficiency. But for the neural D1, we never see isocytes being converted into neurons. So there's nothing to talk about. Right. Okay, so, um, so Bruce wanted to ask, uh, sort of first sort of the general question, why do many of these transcription factors and combinations work so well in vitro, but are not seeming to work in vivo? And then the specific um, question is, can neuro D1 also regulate activity of the ALDH101 um, promoter? So uh, great question. So uh, in vitro, lots of things can happen. And um, uh, indeed, many studies, including our lab, has done lots of this in visual reprogramming. You can generate many different types of neurons. They can become real mature. The problem with that, we try all the same thing working really well in visual. If you move to in vivo, many times it does not work at all. 
And uh, that's based on our really strength, strength analysis, genetic link tracing, and all the other ways like immature stage or BRD or linear tracing. And uh, uh, what was the other part? Um, can NeuroD regulate the ALDH 101 promoter? Yeah. Yeah, so ARDH 101 is an uh, isosome marker. Um, and uh, uh, so normally in your DNS, during development, during neurodevelopment, it's kind of more neurogenic uh, from the stem cells you can push into neurogenesis. So it may shut down the ARDH 101 promoter, but I'm not sure. But the, our genetic linear tracing is inducible. Once you turn on the, uh, the reporter, it's no longer depends on the ARDH11 promoter. It's more kind of a totally different promoter. So that's the promoter like a Rosa Lucas or the uh, CG promoter in the AI14 mouse line is independent of this NOD1. Okay, so this brings us to PTBP1. Um, and we have some other investigators in the audience like Roy and Carlos, but um, Siavash has a question about a recent paper uh, from Roy and Carlos where they used ASOs to downregulate. So no promoters or things. They used um, ASOs to downregulate PPB1 to generate new neurons in dentate gyrus. And they suggest it's radial glia that are converting to neurons, not astrocytes. So have you looked um, Siobhash is asking if you looked in your experiments or if uh, about um, um, or if you have any other things and, and maybe in a broader sense you, um, perhaps you could say a few words about PTDP1 and then we can have others um, talk about their results. Yeah, yeah exactly. Great... And maybe just for just for the audience maybe just say briefly what PTDP1 is and why we're asking about it. Yeah so PTDP1 is a sponsor factor and recently has two phenomenal paper being published. Uh, one is the uh, Huyang's uh, group uh, in ION showing that and we knocked down PDPP1 through the CRISPR -Cas -Cas RX system that uh, you can reprogram the strata exercise into dopaminergic neurons that's the publishing cell. The other one is uh, done by um, uh, Xiaodong Fu's lab at UCSD that using SHI approach, not down PTPP1, you can reprogram the, uh, the claim, uh, reprogram into exercise into local neurons, for example, the neurons in the strata region, uh, in the stratum, or the dopaminergic neurons in the sub nigra. So that's the reason like, uh, we want to see whether that's the you know, generic uh, you know, um, theme or not that exercise can be reprogrammed by different ways. So that's the reason we talk, okay, your D1 does not work. How about the PTPP1? It's like a very interesting because in terms of PTPP1, actually it's well supported by the in vitro culture work. That's a fa fabulous work published by uh, you know, Xiangdong Fu's lab showing that we knocked on PTPP1 and the culture you know, cells can be reprogrammed into neurons and they figure out the exact mechanism. It's a beautiful work. So that's the reason I kind of really say, okay, using our genetic tools and to see if there's any genetic trees exercise being reprogrammed into neurons. So that's what we did. And uh, in terms of the uh, things that you mentioned about uh, in our, our Don Clemens lab, uh, our recent publication about this radio glia, I think that's kind of data is interesting. And this show that this radio glia, which is normally the neural stem cells, on uh, your progenitor cells, and they convert into, uh, you know, promote kind of more, in my opinion, it's more kind of neurogenesis. They go through this double coding stage and then become mature neurons. That's kind of normal way I would think just like a neural D1. Neural D1 can push the neural progenitor cells or neural stem cells towards neurogenesis. But that's kind of, uh, uh, we think it's intrinsic uh, or kind of uh, defined role of neural D1. I know in your neural development. So bias the neural progenitor cells and neural progenitor cells, uh, uh, neural stem cells and neural progenitor cells towards neurogenesis. And the same thing in the integers of knocking down PDPP1. You may bias this radio glia, which is uh, another name for uh, neural stem cells, kind of towards neurogenesis instead of uh, gliogenesis. But that does not mean the endogenous 
mature exercise being reprogrammed. You know, for, to demonstrate that, I would think genetic linear tracing can determine that. But at least in the stratum, we did not see that. And uh, recent uh, you know, preprint by a set of lab also showing that we knock out PTPP1, does not see any reprogramming in the RENA or the uh, stratum or the uh, substrate Libra. So basically, I think um, uh, the dinner jars may be a way, uh, kind of a unique niche that you can bias normally you know, the stem cells towards neurogenesis. Uh, I think uh, I'm not sure, uh, Roy, uh, you, know, uh, you know, agree with my analysis or not, but uh, we'll be interested to, uh, to listen to your opinion to you. Yeah, let's hear from okay. the San Diego group. Hey, yeah, so yeah, we contact Jung uh, this week actually, and yeah, um, but um, yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. Uh, we do think it, we're pushing uh, in a canonical neurogenesis uh, the radial glia cells, and um, yeah, that's what we concluded in in our in our uh, publication. But in our case, we used ASO, so we couldn't sufficiently reduce PTB. I would say in the stratum, in the cortex. So we, I don't think we can say uh, whether mature astrocyte uh, convert, but uh, only as you suggest, as you're saying in the dental jars. Yeah. So you, you can bias the fit of kind of stem cells or progenitor cells. Right. Yeah. But I, I believe that this is also very important, uh, yeah. this, this feature, because, yeah, uh, there are many neurodegenerative diseases that um, you can do it like in Alzheimer's yeah. or others. But yeah, I, there is a difference. But yeah. I said, no, no doubt. No doubt. No, no doubt that, you know, hippocampus is important. Um, uh, you know, to manipulate the cell fit. I think a really exciting project, perhaps rotations projects in your labs would be to perform single cell sequencing analysis or genetic bait mapping to really see what these cells that are expressing or are knocking down PTBP1 or expressing neuro D1, what are they becoming? What are their intermediate states? What are they, what do they first start to up or downregulate and, and what's happening to them? And I, yeah. I yeah, so I it's really important. Yeah, uh, I agree. I would be interested in find that. Uh, I think uh, Seth Bradshaw has done that uh, beautifully. So basically, uh, he did the single cell analysis of uh, this uh, PTPP1 knockout mice. And uh, his study shown that when knock out PTPP1, you change some gene expression, some genes, but not many, there's no fit and switch. So basically, they are still just exercise. And uh, not many changes there. But nonetheless, Roy and Carlos's experiments and then uh, yeah. Professor Fu before shows that if you, I'm talking about just with the ASO, if you, if you lower PTBP1, you're res you have a phenotypic rescue. So something is, the, the whole animal is responding differently. So something is happening in a beneficial way. And I think we just need to fig figure that out. Sure. Yeah. Perfect. So if I can add one thing, so yeah, we saw the, the Black Show uh, new paper also, but uh, the difference there is that he did a total knockout and we're talking about uh, uh, transient reduction. So that's the first thing. And so it's like you, you can, we mentioned like dopamine. So too much is not good, too less is not good. So it's probably something in between or this balance is important. So that's the first thing that can uh, happen. Um, yeah, basically that's it. So uh, Bruce has another question about, and I think this is a, this is kind of a good one that we aren't really considering: is the state of astrocytes can they exert an impact on cell fate change? For example, in highly inflamed environment, um, conversion might be more difficult. Um, and then, what is the best uh, state? He's asking. Great question. Uh, definitely, uh, you know. Um, this whole process will be influenced by the, uh, uh, the environment. Um, so uh, what's the optimal? I, uh, we did not, I, I don't know. Um, okay, um, Yongjie, do you have more questions? Yeah, so I actually, this is not really a question. This is more of a comment. So I'm just kind of a, uh, still get stuck with that I, the observation that the GFAP promoter actually still has a lot of expression in the 
uh, uh, neurons. And uh, so I'm actually uh, realized a little bit that uh, when the AV uh, transduce cells, they have to be uh, internalized and then actually it's uh, more for on the endosome pathway. Um, so I wonder what, uh, what do, do you guys think about this possibility, you know, that uh, this endosome pathway actually uh, uh, later on probably can secrete a lot of uh, ex exosomes that probably um, return some of this AV particle and then get taken up by neurons. And then that's why they probably have a lot of this, uh, some of the uh, neural D there um, um, expressed later on in neurons. Yeah. So, okay. so yeah, just kind of a, I guess, a way to explain this data because it's kind of a, obviously no one has ever really checked this kind of a, you know possibility, but uh, just yeah. a thought. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And um, actually, we do not think the exosome do anything. And uh, because if we restrict uh, the um, new DNA expression, at least in the early stage, into the exercise, we do not see um, uh, neurons uh, expression of the M cherry. And uh, we also did some other kind of experiments. And uh, we do not see any kind of transfer between you know, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, neurons to glia, glia to neurons. There's no clear evidence. But rather, this kind of uh, the promoter activity uh, is kind of, uh, I think, it's induced in the neurons. Because we did like, uh, co-injection of this uh, GFAP, GFP, for example, with the GFAP in your D1M cherry, or vice versa, co-package them, co package the virus or co-inject you know, different propat virus, that's very different. <laughs> so basically the GFAP, just the reporter, they can separate very well. And uh, so that's, we did not see any transfer between this uh, exercise on neurons. Um, so kind of that's our kind of conclusion. There's more kind of the promoter activity is being influenced by um, uh, uh, neural D1. And I think so, I want to you know, mention the AAV virus, you know, you think it's very simple. There's a simple, the RTR, and also simple, this uh, promoter. But in reality, it's more complex than what you think. So the RTR has some like uh, promote activity. So they can bounce lots of the transference factors. And of course you have additional promoter. In addition, the AAV has this intermolecular uh, recombination. So basically two AAV, two single uh, you know, AAVs, they can recombine and uh, form these circles, like a head to head, tail to tail, head to tail, that kind of, you know, uh, configurations. They can recombine in the middle or, you know, with the time actually they can form big circles. So in that case, the, the regulation just is so complex with the time. And it's not as uh, we think that simple. Right. Okay. I, I think we've gotten through all of the questions. This was the longest Q&A session, but I think it's really important to take our time and go through every question and talk through things. Uh, DeLong's in his Tesla, it seems. And um, yeah, this, oh, we have an, oh, Roy's just, all right, that's not something else. Um, yeah, I think it's important that, um, and I, I think this is one of the advantages of NeuroZoom and then just Zoom in general, is like, if we have questions for our colleagues around the world, we can ask directly. And um, so, Thanks, Chen Li, for um, coming in and sharing your new data. And um, of course, others um, who are working on similar things, we really wanna present the latest results. So and any team can can present their, their data and um, come in for questions. So thanks everyone for, for staying and um, Chen Li, get some rest, drink some water and we'll see everyone Next yeah, week. I would say thank you very much for this opportunity to explain and uh, to you know, communicate, uh, interact with you all. So if you have any questions, just shoot me an email. Great, great. Thanks, Kenny. Great. great. Thank you, Ems, for a good talk. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you, Aaron. Bye-bye.